Welcome back everyone. Today we're taking the next step in concrete modeling. We'll talk about the microplane model and how to implement it in ANSYS. Now the microplane model will have quite a few advantages over the Menetre Willem model that we used previously. So first we can include damage, which is important if you're doing a cyclic test. Damage is going to be the reduction in stiffness when you exceed a certain stress state. The implementation that we'll be doing is also non-local, which is going to really help our convergence and our mesh sensitivity. So those are two things that we didn't really consider in much detail in the previous video on concrete, but it turns out because you have a strain softening material that you can have a very strong mesh sensitivity and convergence can be quite rough when you're in that strain softening region. So let's talk about how we set the parameters for our night microplane model. Now, in the ideal world, we could just use a stress strain diagram as we've shown here, but unfortunately that's not how we're going to do that. Instead, we have to build up our drucker Prager yield surface. Now this yield surface captures everything that we need to know about triaxial st stress state and when that material yields. So the blue line here is our original yield surface. The adjacent orange line is the hardened yield surface. So once our stress state reaches the original blue yield surface, that yield surface will then move so that we have a new yield criteria. So this is how we define our hardening. Now the yield surface itself has three different regions. Over here, we have the compression cap. In the middle where we have this linear region, we have the drucker prager yield condition. And then on this right side, we have our tension cap. The most interesting stress states that we can see from this cap, if we draw a 60 degree angle right here, where this intercepts with my original yield function, that is a stress state for my uniaxial stress, which I'll just call FC. At that point, that's where it transitions from drucker prager to the tension cap. If you have a hydrostatic tension pressure on there, this point is called T0, and that's going to be approximately equal to one third times your tension strength. Now on the other side of this diagram, where we have this hydrostatic compression, usually that's about equal to two times your uniaxial strength right there, within reason. So that's an approximation that usually we don't have test data for, in the description below, you can download the Excel document that I used to create this plot. It can be a useful exercise to go through that and punch in some of the parameters to see what this looks like so that you can know that you're getting some realistic values. Now, in addition to the two elastic parameters that we always need to set, you'll need to define 13 different parameters for your microplane model. So let's talk about them. The first three right here define your yield surface, and that's based off your uniaxial strength, biaxial strength, and tensile strength. Now we talked about this previously and you can define them in the same way as you did in the first video as to here, but you can also use some other simple approximations if you like. Next, we move on to the compression cap. The compression cap is gonna be defined with two parameters. The first parameter here is our transition from drucker prager yielding to the compression cap. It is always a negative value and it usually is approximately negative two thirds of your biaxial compressive strength. Now you can always set that to a large value, for example, negative one times your biaxial compressive strength, and that's acceptable, but as a first guess, this is pretty reasonable. Our next parameter is the compression cap R. Usually we just set this equal to two, but it can vary possibly between one and three. If you have triaxial test data, you can possibly find this number. Otherwise, you can set it to a value that achieves this point right here being approximately equal to two times your uniaxial compressive strength. So we have further parameters that define hardening, our damage, and non-local behavior, which helps stabilize the method. For hardening, the constant D defines how much hardening we have. Now that can vary within a certain range, but that is something that we'll need to calibrate to our stress strain curve. On the other hand, there's a specific tensile hardening property RT here that's pretty much always set to one, and that never really changes. If we move down to damage, there are two parameters that we need to calibrate to our stress strain curve, and that is the compression damage threshold and the compression damage evolution. Tension damage is usually approximated based off of your compression damage. So tension damage is gonna be approximately 1.5 times your compression damage parameter and your tension damage threshold is usually assumed to be zero because we assume we have damage right away once we go into tension. For the non-local parameters, the C is a range constant and it should be greater than four times L squared, where L in this case is your typical element length. 
So if you're setting that parameter too small, it's not actually incorporating any non-local behavior. The final parameter is this over non-local parameter. It's a little bit tricky to know what to set that to, but you can vary it between one to three to maybe four um, just to help stabilize your method. So if things aren't converging, try playing with this M parameter just to see what it does. It mainly determines and helps you with convergence. It doesn't really affect your material properties. Now let's explore what these three calibration parameters will do for our stress strain curve. So if we look at our hardening parameter, we can see that increasing the hardening is going to increase our post yield behavior. So our post yield behavior is happening right about here. That's when we have our first yielding. And what happens past that can vary quite significantly based on your hardening parameter. So you can see if you set this parameter ridiculously high, you're going to get entirely unrealistic results where I have effectively increased my compressive strength to an astronomical number just because I've set this parameter D to something unrealistic, in this case, 10 to the 11th PSI. Moving on to the damage threshold, that sets how long this plateau occurs before we start accumulating damage and our stiffness begins to reduce. So usually we want that happening somewhere within this region around the peak, not too far after the peak, so there's a pretty narrow range around which this parameter actually works. Lastly, our compression damage parameter shows us how quickly our stiffness drops off once we've started accumulating damage. So this is post plateau. So it'll only start accumulating damage after your plateau here. And the greater value of beta C will introduce a greater drop off in your stiffness. Now, when you're using the microplane model, it's really useful to define a model of just a unit cube so that you can see what your stress strain behavior is based on your material properties so that you can verify that it's actually a reasonable material. So what we'll first do is we'll go into engineering data here and I'm going to create a new model called concrete. Now this concrete, the only thing I'm going to set is my isotropic elastic material properties and I'm going to overwrite these values later, so just fill them in with dummy values. So I'll just put one for my Young's modulus and 0.2 for Poisson's ratio. So here I've made my unit cube because I'm using English units in this case. That's a one inch by one inch by one inch cube. But if you're using megapascals, you should be doing a one millimeter cube. The first thing I'll do is define my symmetry conditions for this. So we'll go to model here. We'll click on symmetry and I'm going to define three different symmetry regions. So I'll click on the bottom face here and assign that a symmetry with a normal axis of Y. And then I'll click also on this back face here and have a symmetry normal of Z. And finally, rotating it around this way, we'll click on this face, create a new symmetry region with the X axis for that symmetry. So if I look at all three of my symmetries, we see that I have my Y axis symmetry my z-axis symmetry and my x-axis symmetry, all three on that corner there. Next, we'll generate a mesh. I'm going to set my element size to a default of 0.25. For this example, I'll use linear elements just to make it a little bit more efficient, and I'll generate that mesh. Next, I'll impose my deformation. So I'm going to want to compress this, and I want to test my uniaxial compression just to see how this works. So we'll go to static structural, and we'll apply a displacement condition, this top face, and then we'll be displacing it in the negative Y direction. And because you have a, a unit cube, you can define this as your strain that you want to go to. So if I want to go to a strain of 0.01, I'm going to impose a dif displacement of negative 0.01. We'll set a few other analysis properties. So we'll go to analysis settings here. Let's turn large deflection on because we do have strains of 1%. And then let's also add some auto time stepping. I'm going to turn this off but I will define substeps, and I'm just going to define 200 substeps for my load application here so that I can have 200 points in my stress strain diagram. And now that's everything except for the material properties, and that's where things are going to change pretty significantly. Now the microplane model can't be implemented in just the standard workbench functions. We need to go to some advanced functionality using something called APDL commands. So let's talk about how we do that. So first I want to assign my material property to this cube. So I'll, I'll go to material. I'll, I see I have concrete right here. You'll notice obviously I don't really have any material properties for my concrete. I, I set a dummy modulus and a dummy Poisson's ratio. So I'll right click on this and create a material assignment. I'll select the cube. That's where I want this material to be applied. 
And then I'm going to right click on that. I'm going to insert a command. Now in this command, I'm going to type one line of code and I'll say conc C-O-N-C is equal to mat ID. Now what this is going to do is it's going to assign a number for my material that I'm going to manually overwrite later with a command when it runs the analysis. Now that I've assigned that I want to overwrite my concrete material within this region that I've defined here, next you'll scroll down to your static structural, you'll right click there and you'll insert a new command here. So it's way down at the bottom. Now in this command, if you look in the description down below, there are two different files, one for PSI and one for megapascal units. I'm going to copy and paste the PSI into here. Now the first command is going to run is called this prep seven, that's pre-processing. So it's going to be changing my material properties and that's a pre-processing, not a post-processing thing, which comes after the solution. Here's where I'll define my elastic mat material properties, my modulus and my Poisson's ratio. And this does have to follow your unit convention. So this is in PSI and Poisson's ratio is always unitless. Next, we have to define our 13 different microplane model properties. You can see them all listed right here using some typical values, assuming a 6,000 PSI concrete, biaxial strength, tensile strength, and the other parameters as follows. Now notice my non-local range parameter, I've set this to one square inch. Now my element size is about 0.25 inches, so this is sufficiently large to capture my non-local behavior. So that's a good parameter. Lastly, we need to set our element type. If you're using linear elements, this should be 215. And if you're using quadratic elements, this should be 216. Now below this, you don't need to change anything unless you really know what you're doing and you want to change something. So it's going to be assigning the elastic properties that I've defined above, assigning the microplane properties, non-local properties, and then it's going to assign this all to the material conch, C-O-N-C right here. So right here, you'll notice all the conch that's highlighted, that all has to line up with the material designation that I gave right here. So if I have a different material designation, you will also need to change your material designation in the code down here. So I'm applying this to my concrete material here. After defining the material properties, we also need to change the element type. So we're going to be changing to a new type of element. In this case, it's 215 or 216. That is a coupled element that can incorporate this non-local behavior. So that is required and it's not an element that's automatically going to be generated by the workbench. So this goes to the element switch and then we proceed to our solution down here. So now that's ready to go, so let's hit solve. Now that ran in about 15 seconds, so it's quite efficient. You'll notice that my convergence behavior was incredibly good. It never actually exceeded my force criteria, which is great. Let's define a few results. I want to define two probes here. Let's define a stress probe on my top surface. And rather than doing all results, we'll just do the normal stress in the Y direction. And next I want to do a deformation probe. So we'll do probe deformation also on that top surface. And here I want my deformation in the Y direction. And let's hit solve. So I'll pull up my tables down here. For my deformation probe, we can see that it just varies linearly as I increase my deformation. And my stress is going to give me something that looks like my stress strain diagram. Now, because I'm looking at a unit cube, my deformation in the Y direction is equal to the strain, and that's a little bit easier way of getting your total strain out of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this into an Excel sheet right here, and then I'll also copy my stress into an Excel sheet right here so that we'll see our stress strain diagram. And I'll just highlight all here and insert a chart. Now you'll notice in this chart, it's all negative. That's because we're looking at compression here. But if you have a stress strain curve that you want to match, you can then play with your parameters until the, this curve looks good. And in this case, I'm going to be happy with this curve. So now I'm going to implement this curve into a reinforced concrete model. So I've opened up my previous model from the last video on reinforced concrete beams. If you remember, my beam elements here have been assigned a type of reinforcement and they have a material property of rebar. So those can yield, it had a bilinear isotropic hardening. And I had defined for my concrete material here for my beam, a mandatory Willem model. So everything is going to stay the same for this model, but I'm going to change my material properties from that mandatory Willem model 
to the microplane model. So what we need to do for that is we need to open up our materials here and right click on concrete and create a material assignment. Now I need to select the geometry where this material assignment is going to apply. So I'll select my beam right here. That's where I'm going to overwrite my materials. And I need to right click, insert a command. And again, my command is conk is equal to mat ID. So remember conk here is the name of the material that I'm going to be using in my APDL command later. Mat ID is a standard constant that's always going to be the same when you do this. Next, I'm gonna double check my mesh here. I'm using linear elements, so that's a good thing to check. If you're using quadratic elements, then you'd use a different element type. And now in my static structural, I'm going to insert a command way at the bottom here. And I'm once again going to copy and paste that information. All right, so that's copied. Again, my material name was conch, so I don't need to change this everywhere where it shows up. My element type is 215 because I'm using linear elements and not 216, which is correct for quadratic elements. And the rest of the material properties I'm going to leave the same. Now we can run our solution, works the same as before. It will probably take quite a while, so we'll come right back with this. If you're bored, watch your force convergence and see what happens. And we made it, one hour later. Convergence for the microplane is a lot better than the Menetray Willow model that we had looked at before. Still takes a long time to run, in this case, I started with 200 time steps and it broke it up into a few more down here uh, where we have the bisections. If we look at some of our results. We can see we have our deformation. We had applied 1.2 inches of deformation down at this end here, so that all looks good. If we look at the normal stress in the Z direction here, and I'll turn off my bearing pads so that they are not going to bother us. So we'll hide those. We can see we have our primarily cracked region right here. This model is not going to directly show you where your cracks are. It is effectively a smeared crack model with damage. Uh, and we also have a tension region right up here with some compression right there. If we'd like to look at our rebar stresses, we'll look at normal stress in the X direction and we'll show just these bodies. So we'll click hide all other bodies there. So we can see down here, we do have some yielding that's above 60 KSI for my stress, equivalent plastic strain. Similarly, we have some yielding down there, so it looks pretty good. Our force reaction, we can see that it's significantly in the Z direction here, and that's because I had fixed that bearing pad at the base, and so effectively I fixed both ends. So we have some arching action going on from my force here down to my support over here. And that is the microplane model, and that's all for today. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe. I will see you next time.